Good afternoon, everyone. It is 4 p.m. on Thursday, the 8th of October. The sun is still sitting very high here in Centurion, so summer is well on its way. We had our first rain in Gauteng just this week, and it was absolutely superb to just smell that rain. I don't know whether it's just me, but I absolutely love it. I hope you all had a great and fantastic week so far, and I would like to welcome you all um, for our 22nd webinar, sponsored once again by the SpaceNet Global Group with the support of EasyMed and Medici, an integrated practice management system, obviously with the telehealth platform. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, do you know by now, I like to share who is joining us today, and I can confirm that we've had 730 people that registered for today's webinar, and we had 18 disciplines as well, plus a few doctors, just to add on to that. And I can confirm that the, um, the webinar has been accredited for one ethical CEU. We only got that confirmation through just this morning. So thank you very much for that. Wendy and her team who's sitting behind that little black screen that you can see for all her hard work, just to get everything organized for today's webinar. Guys, I would just like um, one second to, to focus especially on the podiatrists today. I can confirm that it is International Podiatry Day. And I would really like to wish all the podiatrists and the society the best of luck to try and get a bit of attention to, to foot health and also to get to podiatry and the message to the public, the government and other healthcare workers. I know there's 22 podiatrists that is joining us today. So guys, happy International Podiatry Day just once again. Um, I can also confirm that we've got close to 200 psychologists joining us today. There's about 80 physiotherapists, there's 60 occupational therapists. We've got 51 speech therapists and audiologists. There's close to 30 dietitians, just over 30 registered counselors, 25 medical orthotists and prosthetists, there's nine social workers, 10 chiropractors, and 22 optometrists. And no badly, I'm not forgetting about the bios. <laughs> there are 151 biokinetic healthcare professionals joining on the, on the call today. So guys, a warm welcome to, to each and every one of you. Now, for those of you who are regular webinar attendees, you would know that over the past two weeks, we've been touching and discussing this topic around uh, health ecosystems. And we specifically started focusing on diabetes and the healthcare professionals that forms part of this journey of a patient with diabetes. Now we created a platform where you can literally just show your interest, just show of hands, whether in the future you would like to form part of such a network. We created a URL, which unfortunately didn't work 100% last week. We apologize for that, but guess what? It's up and running and in working order. And I would just like to ask if there's anyone that is still interested in joining such a network, and it's, it's not an established network, it's just show of hands, you're interested in joining it, please um, connect with us. I'm just copying the link here on my left-hand side. I'm going to put it in the chat functionality so that everyone can see it. Uh, right click paste and there you go and that's for anyone that deals on a regular basis with a patient with diabetes now obviously if you need to go and listen to any of our previous webinars it is available on numerous platforms including our website which you can see on the screen easymed.solutions just navigate to the webinar tab and you can find any of our previous webinars right there for you to listen to either on a podcast or go and watch it on the um, YouTube channel as well I literally just copied and pasted that in the chat functionality as well, just to make that a little bit easier for you. Um, so where to start today? We're going into a completely different direction. Like we said last week, this is gonna be the first of a series, a short series of three webinars. We're gonna talk about how to set up your practice, how to market your, market your practice. And if you think about closing the doors, what do you need to do then as well? So it's a different direction and I've got two gentlemen joining me today to start this discussion. So, and the discussion today is specifically around the business of establishing a successful healthcare practice. So where do you start? What do you need to think about? What sort of tick boxes do you need to go by to make everything successful in your practice? And joining us here today, first of all, is Bharti Harps, the man who can actually give Dion Biyush, my good friend, a, a run for his money on a bicycle and perhaps with his running shoes on. Um, uh -huh. And I just... <laughs> I recently found out that Bertie actually took up BMX riding with the rest of his family. So good on you, Bertie. <laughs> Guys, just to frame who Bertie is, where he fits in, 
but he's been um, uh, in biokinetics for 14 years. He's also got his master's in the field of biokinetics. He's been in private practice for over 11 years now. He's a business owner, a leader, a speaker, and I think most importantly, probably a husband and a father. Um, now, if that really wasn't enough, he's currently serving as the vice president with the Biokinetics Association of South Africa, BASA. So, Bharti, thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us and coming to share some of your knowledge with us. Thank you, Lonnie. Much appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Dion, to you guys. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. I think it's going to be impactful, and I think we're going to have a lot of influence from today's session. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Bharti. And then, of course, I've got Dion Beard with us as well. Dion being the director of the ProfNet Medical and the SpaceNet Global Group Executive for Operations. Now, Dion, as you know, has been in private practice for many years. He comes with a wealth of experience and knowledge. And Dion was also, back in the day, the chairperson of the South African Society of Physiotherapy. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic having you with us as well again today, this afternoon. Dion. Thank you, Lani. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, putting your four to five o'clock aside for us every Thursday. It's really awesome to see such great numbers continuing even as we come out of COVID. Um, so, so very welcome to everyone and thanks for, for making the time and, and welcome back. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you, Dion. Much appreciated. I think as, of, as you know, all of you know, my name is Lani Ace and I'm a product manager with the SpaceNet Global Group and it's my absolute pr privilege to be your host again this afternoon. So attendees, I think between, <clears throat> you can probably see that between these two gentlemen, they will have a lot of tips, a lot of information and personal experience that they can share with you with regards to creating and setting up a practice in South Africa, taking all the regulatory bodies into consideration. They both have lots of experience in private practice and have represented, as you heard, their professions on an association or a society level. But just a disclaimer that during our discussions this afternoon, it's just impossible for us to address all your specific and unique practice requirements. So should there be anything specifically related to your practice and your practice setup, we would still advise you to talk to an advisor, which may of course include one of these two gentlemen. We're gonna try and cover as much as possible, but please, this is a general approach. And um, we hope to cover you know, some of your questions as well, which you can pose for us in the chat functionality or use the Q&A functionality, and we will keep a close eye on those two things. Um, I think I need to keep quiet now, um, as the purpose of this afternoon is, is really to, to talk to you guys on the other side of the screen and to see how we can assist you with setting up your practice. Um, just a quick word, I think the majority of the attendees are actually members of the healthcare, healthcare profession society. Let me try and get that again. HPCSA, much easier, um, of South Africa, that regulatory authority. But obviously, there's the allied healthcare professional, as well as SANC, as well as the, um, the, the social services professions as well. And they've got their own council. So our approach is going to be towards HPCSA. But please just keep in mind that you do need to know the guidelines, the rules, the regulations, the ethics from your regulatory authority as well this afternoon. So I'm gonna pause there, and I actually wanna start by perhaps painting a picture. I think every single healthcare professional find them somewhere along their, their, their professional journey or their career path, and they find them in a physical location as well with regards to their work. But at some point, you might perhaps think in the back of your mind, I've always wanted my own private practice, but I've got no idea where to start. You can either be a student perhaps, and you just finish your commserve, and next year you want to start your own private practice. You might be currently in, private, in, in public sector, but you want to move into private, or you just want to break away from your partner and do your own thing. Or you haven't worked for a while, you've maybe worked overseas for a while and you're returning back, maybe on one of the first repatriation flights back into South Africa, when the borders are actually open for a change. So there's lots of scenarios, but the question still comes up, where do you start? Especially now with COVID, with lockdown, how do you start and, and go about setting up your private practice? Now, Bertie, I'm looking at you. I see you, you're ready for this this afternoon. Wouldn't you say that defining the purpose of your practice is a good starting point? Well, yes, Lonnie. Um, you know, everything in life starts with a thought or a dream. Now, that thought is a starting point of setting up your practice, okay? 
but how you feed that thought will determine your success in your practice, if that makes sense, you know? Now, there are a number of factors that will determine of how you are going to feed that thought. But firstly, like you mentioned just now, what I want to discuss or what I want to ask you is, what is the purpose of opening up your practice? Now, that's probably the number one question that never gets asked by anyone who wants to start a practice is, what is my purpose for starting a practice? Is it for a reason that you've been invited to open up a practice with someone else? Or do you feel like it's maybe peer pressure that mm. since everyone else is opening up a practice, now I should open up a practice as well. There are many reasons for this purpose of why you want to open up your practice. But most importantly is, is that you need to be honest with yourself and ask that question because often we find that practitioners open up practices and once they've opened up the practice, they realize that this is not for them. And that's where often businesses fail or practices fail. Now, Dion, obviously we know, we don't want to see any practices fail. We really want to see practices succeed and flourish. We really want to see practices grow and develop, in, in, especially in South Africa. So that's the first question I want to ask you, Lonnie, is that what is the purpose of opening up your practice? Then secondly, I want to ask you another question before we move on, and that is what kind of practice do you want to open up? Okay? And that is also crucial to establish and determine from the word go. What kind of practice do you want to open up? Do you want to... What do you mean by that, Bertie? Excuse me. Yeah? No, what do you mean by that? What kind of practice? So, 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 Lani, I mean, what kind of practice do you want to open up? We all know there's different types of practices, but we don't often think about what kind of practice we want to open up. So, within the thought process, we actually want to decide, do we want to open up a small practice? Would we like to open up a big practice? Or do you think we should open up an ordinary practice or an extraordinary practice? Now, from my side, I really hope for every viewer here on this webinar would like to open up an extraordinary practice because we really want to open up practices that will excel and progress and grow within this country, you know, because the more we grow, the more we can actually assist other people. At the end of the day, Lani, as you know, we are health professionals and we are there for the need and the care of other people. So the, the bigger we are, the bigger we can assist them in the process. So that is what I mean by what kind of practice do you want to open up? Now, these two questions will largely determine your planning process in setting up successfully your practice in the future. Now, Dion, as we mentioned or discussed earlier, um, just think about it. If you go on holiday and or, or you're going to a new destination or you're going to visit someone that you've never been before, what do you do? Do you jump in your car and just drive with the hopes that you will get there without looking at a map? No, probably not. What we actually do is, is we use a map as a reference or as a guide to see that we're on the right direction and the right path to reach our destination. Now, you see, this, um, this sample of, of principle is exactly the same for our practice or, or our business. And what we need is, is we need a map or we need a business plan that can help us actually reach that end result that will determine our success in the future. Now, Someone once said that fail to plan and you actually plan to fail. Now, I don't know if you didn't know or did know, but 50% of all small businesses that open up in this country actually fail or liquidate at the end of the year. And that is really sad news because we don't want to see businesses, in particularly practices, fail or liquidate. We really want to see practices grow, as we said, mentioned earlier. So, what is it all about? Lonnie, it's all about getting ready. It's all about focusing on the planning phase. Now, for those of you who know Henry Ford, he was from the Ford Motoring Company who actually started Ford many, many moons ago. He said, before anything else, getting ready is the secret to success. So we need to get ourselves ready because the planning process in successfully setting our practice will help us to achieve success later on in our practice career. Now, Lonnie, and just, yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. I, I think to tie into that, I mean, I heard a, a, a old proverb that says, uh, if you've got four hours to chop down a tree, spend three hours sharpening your blade. Um, and I think very often people grab the tool they've got, they've got four hours and they're hacking away, but it's so inefficient. Um, yeah. But the, the slowing down to speed up, the planning is so crucial. 
And it's not yeah. just that business plan, but also that financial. I think there's a business map and awesome. then there's the financial map as well to say, how do I test whether I'm actually achieving what I was hoping to achieve? Not, not so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Dion, just follow, follow up on that. They actually say that for every minute that you're planning, you will actually prevent two minutes or take away two minutes of execution. So it's almost like a double effect just by taking the time to think through the process and plan properly how you're going to successfully set up your practice in the future. And that's where I want to come to is that there are a number of core values that by starting successfully preparing your practice, you will actually have an increase in the odds of having success later on in life in, the, in your practice career. And then obviously you will compound that success. Remember, you don't only just achieve success, you actually want to compound that success and grow that success. And then last, lastly, you will have more options later in life to continue to grow onto that factor. That's how we're actually going to gain more and more sustainability and also eventually lead to um, growing your practice successfully. So, Lani, to answer your question, that is essentially how we successfully will set up your practice for the future. So, what, what I'm hearing here is that you need to take time out, you need to sit, think, plan what the purpose of your practice has to be or what you want it to be the strategy that you want to follow to get there. Do a proper business plan. Think of what your core values should be and what type of practice you want to be. And you mentioned two things. Bharti, you mentioned a kind of practice, ordinary or extraordinary. And Dion, I think you've mentioned this before in a previous web webinar, the different types of practices. And maybe you can just elaborate a little bit on, on that again. Sure. Sure, I think the, the types of practices are obviously determined. One can run a business in so many different ways and, um, and register that in so many different ways. But I think it's important that we ensure that we, within the framework of our regulator, I'm going to use the HPCSA regulation here as a reference point, knowing that the, uh, many of the other regulators have very similar positions. Um, but that would have to be clarified in your specific regulator. But in the HPCSA, you can only run clinical services in one of four ways. And I do want to reference one of our webinars back on the 23rd of July. Um, if anybody wants to go back and watch that full webinar for the detail, um, you're welcome to go to our YouTube channel that Lonnie did paste in the, in the chat. Um, but go and have a look at that. There's, there's now 22 different resources there that I think are very valuable uh, to running your practice. Um, but in that, we just spoke about the four, really. And that is Solus Practitioner, uh, practicing in your own personal name against your ID number as your registration as such. Um, and then on the other end of the extreme is your incorporated practice or your um, personal liabilities company. Um, and that's the closest you're gonna to get to a corporate type of setup for your practice. And then in between those two, you've got a partnership, which I would really strongly dis, uh, disincentivize anybody to consider. Um, and then the other one is association. So how do you actually associate various practice entities to each other uh, to make uh, the practice effective and efficient? So, so I think that's the four really from a structural point of view. Um, but just while I've got the mic, I think, um, uh, a couple of things that Bati said earlier, which is so important, is what, what you were saying, Bati, about deciding why you want to go into practice, what is your purpose, um, and what type of practice. I think what's crucial there is very often you said, you know, people want to just open up a practice because of peer pressure. Um, I lectured to final year students in setting up their practices and business and how to run healthcare practices. And I always ask the question to the final years is, how many of you are going to start your practice once you finish ComServe? And it, it is shocking how many put their hand up. Um, and I think it's very often, you know, it's just that next thing. So I'm qualified. So, you know, the next thing that my family expects and so on is to go into a practice, not really realizing what it actually means. Never having even worked into a practice themselves. They want to start one fresh, no experience. So uh, I really think that one must stay away from the ego elements of setting up a practice. Um, one must understand how much time you're actually going to spend outside of clinical work in running your practice. And that's often the biggest shocker is that people go into it going, I'm a great clinician, I'm gonna start my own practice. Well, it takes you being a great financial manager, a great HR manager, a great yeah. IT expert to set up all your stuff, market. Um, all of these elements are distracting you away from actual patient care because you're actually building a business that employs other people that are only focusing on patient care while you have to take care of all the rest. So they have to go now with our eyes wide open and then the third element to this is often uh, people going to this, as you rightly said, Bharti, we in healthcare because we want to help people and make a difference in people's lives. And um, that's what drew us to study it in the first place. And um, now you have to balance this kind of non-profit um, a, a caring kind of role in our minds, in our hearts, uh, to an actual for-profit, if that's how you decide to set up your practice and business that is actually going to return profits, 
It's going to pay you a good salary. There's going to be profits at the end of the year and so on so that you can ensure your future. And there's often a big wrestling between me even talking about money, never mind earning money and making a profit to this need to sort of assist and help people. So, so being able to go into that and balance those is, is, is a very careful balancing act, I think. Yeah, absolutely, Dion. I think just to add on a point for, for the purpose of setting up your practice, I think we often refer to it as accidental um, setting up your practice or accidental purpose, yeah. and then purposeful purpose um, mm. of setting up your practice. And I think that's where that category falls into is the accidental practice. People yeah. accidentally fell into a practice not <laughs> knowing what they got themselves into. <laughs> and, and that unfortunately is actually a huge pitfall that we see within our profession uh, or, or in the profession or in the industry, the health industry. Mm. And it's often also considered as a, as a blind spot, which we will discuss a bit more in detail later. But yes, you're absolutely right, Jan. And then obviously the money factor, yes, we all, we, we know that there's, we should not do any of our work for financial gain, but at the end of the day, business is business and money matters. And that's why we also work. It's not only for the care of people, but it's also to put food on the table and to look after ourselves and to look after our families and our friends and whoever we need to take care of. Um, so when it comes to finances, that is extremely important within a business. And yes, we will definitely touch base on that today. Yeah. But while you're talking about finances, gents, I've never owned an my own private practice. I've always worked for someone else. Um, surely there's a lot of cash that you need to put on the table when you open a practice. And I know some disciplines would require equipment, et cetera, et cetera, products, much more so than other disciplines. Um, but is that something that you need to consider? And, and how do you consider that? How do you take care of that cash from the, from the word go? Well, Lonnie, most importantly is, is that you need to look at your source of funding. Where are you going to get money from? And, and do you have, actually have money? So the amount of money that you, will, that you have will eventually determine what you can spend. Because the best advice I can probably give you today is do not spend what you do not have. That is so crucial. Many practitioners make that biggest mistake. They open up massive loans and then they buy all of these equipment. They establish a the big practice. And then when, when, when the business starts running, they start realizing that they cannot keep up to the loan repayment. And that's where often businesses fail as well. It's just purely because of that fail of planning. And I think what needs to happen here is, is that you need to carefully plan your finances and what we call a budget. It's almost like a cash flow forecast that will determine how much money you actually have to spend and how much money you can't have in a bank account to buy equipment. Um, another pitfall that I see in practitioners is that they overspend on equipment. So they will like I mentioned earlier, buy the best and the biggest equipment and the most that I can out of what I can buy for that practice. But essentially, you don't actually really need to start big. Rather start small and then grow onto that oh. practice. Rather oh. grow bit by bit and step by step. There is absolutely no need to buy the best equipment, to buy the Rolls Royce of equipment in your practice. You can really settle for second best and something that's really giving you the same outcome measures for recording or for measuring the data, and that will assist you in your new intervention plan or your care. So yes, when it comes to spending, be very wise, be careful, rather have some guidance in this, rather find people, specialists that deals with these matters to assist mm. you in making the right decisions. Dion, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. And I think um, we, we, we unfortunately see the, the, the bad side of, of decisions when uh, a practitioner possibly moves into a space where they go, you know, badly, I think in biokinetics, you know, having a Cybex machine is almost like one of those standard things that you need, both in treatment, measurement, outcomes, and all of those things. And we know these things come at a high ticket price. Um, and the question should always be, if I'm going to expose myself to expenses like that, what is the actual return on investment, the ROI, on that specific piece of equipment. Now, we've spoken about the financial plan and the cash flow forecast. That's generally for the practice. And now I'm saying, okay, I've got an anchor practice. I can see what the finances are going to look like if, if all my assumptions are correct. And uh, I now want to buy a partial weight-bearing treadmill machine uh, or, or, or some, some fantastic um, neuropsych evaluation software or I want to uh, uh, buy a Cybex machine or whatever it might be. And the question is, firstly, what is the evidence around that? And why I'm asking that question is, um, you know, right now, you might find that some funders or some, some patients are willing to pay for certain care. But later on, when the evidence is questionable, um, you might find that they're going, hang on a second, we no longer fund or pay for that. 
Now you find yourself with a bit of a lemon. You've got an expensive piece of equipment. Um, the schemes are not paying for it. And you're now trying to find a way to make this uh, sort of sort of balance. And we see it in the examples like a robotic assisted walking, which is really fantastic pieces of equipment, but that cost far in excess of a million rand. The question is, what can you achieve with that? What is the evidence? What can you do without that equipment, but with your hands or with more uh, uh, appropriate equipment that you can afford at this point? Um, and then what's the return on investment? How many treatments must you do using that piece of equipment to actually get that, that, that return on that investment before you're actually even starting to make money off that specific investment in that piece of equipment? And these are questions we have to ask carefully because if we don't and we then spend the money, uh, schemes are not paying for that specific cover. Suddenly, halfway through your, your return on investment plans, they stop paying for it. Um, you're now sitting in a bit of a quandary. And we often, in those situations, start seeing a bit of creative billing creeping in. And that's where practitioners find themselves in a bit of a hot spot uh, where there's a reviews on, 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 on claims that are going through to schemes. So I think that's very important, as well as from the Health Professions Council. And please, we've got reams of podcasts on that, so, uh, podcasts and, and, and YouTube clips on, on, on our previous webinars on that. So I'm not going to go down that line. Um, but so, so I think it's important that you assess each piece of equipment for the value it can bring back to your practice, its evidence, um, and its sustainability. Um, but you can divide these kind of costs up into two. Alani, you were asking about the, the money uh, sort of investment costs. There's two types. There's a, there's, a, there's, there's a startup capital that you have to spend before you've even seen your first patient. You know, getting the rooms right, getting a desk in front in your reception, uh, the, the, the equipment that you decide to, to, to use as, as part of your startup practice. Um, all of that is money you're going to spend before there's any revenue, um, before you even open your doors often. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the working capital. You know, now that my doors are open, I need to be paying rent, electricity, the receptionist's salary, and so on. Those are your working capital requirements. And you have to look at both of those. Um, and then also have a look overall is how long is it going to take me to actually pay back my, my startup capital and actually cover my, my working capital costs. So, so there's a lot of considerations around that. But I think what really is important is that we go back to evidence-based practice, look at investing in good equipment that's going to give us the outcomes, uh, because that's what drives the patients to come back and speak to the friends and say, that's where you need to go, because the outcomes is what has changed my life, not just the fact that I've gone and, and seek healthcare. Mm -hmm. well, that's absolutely right, Dion. I mean, over and over you see that uh, people overspend on big equipment and often you can find something a lot more cheaper and a lot more affordable that actually can give you better outcome measures that will help you with your intervention plan going forth and give, providing the care that the patient needs. And like you say, at the end of the day, word of mouth, mm. that is pretty much the best marketing that you can do. If you, mm. um, if you provide a service with excellence, that is yep. where your word of mouth is going to come from and that's how you gain market yourself quite well. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing here, uh, Sorry, Lonnie, I'm looking at test means um, comment. It also, same goes for committing to long-term leases before establishing a patient base. So true, test mean. I mean, we often see that as well. People actually go out and get a large space because now what they want to do is they want to set up a multidisciplinary practice. But often the pitfall here is, is that they set up the multidisciplinary practice before they have the disciplines involved. So now they have this large piece of space and they are praying and hoping and begging for biokineticists and physios and OTs and chiros and everyone to come on board and please come in my space and, you know, come and work with me. And that is also quite a pitfall. Like I said, you know, you've got to be careful for these type of things. Rather do you planning well beforehand, get everyone together and then decide upon how much space each person is going to need. And then you will determine what type of space you will need. Also, just a point on that is that in terms of the lease, how many years are you going to take out the lease? Now, many years ago when I opened up my practice, we had a choice of a three-year and a five-year lease. Now, I was so excited to open up my practice. I was so committed into my practice. I said, immediately, let's go for a five-year lease. But my partner back then said, no, let's go for a three-year lease. And I said, no, why? Five years, we are committed to this. We're going to do this. We love the space. It's a great location. We're going to do well here. Well, the long of the, the short of the long is that three years later, we moved out of there and we moved into a bigger space, a better space um, that provided more care and quality for and, and service for our practice. But yes, that's another thing that you can look at there, Tasneen, from a long-term um, lease point of view. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Thanks for picking up on Tasneen's question there. So, yeah. Sorry, Dion, did you, you want to mention something before I ask my next question? Yeah, just to add to that is, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because when you're starting up a practice and you're not quite sure, you don't want to tie yourself into a five or a 10-year lease in mm. case things don't quite work out as you planned. You know, 
And we, we always say here in the business, no business ever fails in Excel. So be careful. I mean, we do as much cash flow forecasts and business planning and so on. Um, and those never fail. No one's going to draw up an Excel sheet that sets them up for failure. But life happens. Reality happens. Look at 2020 and what that did to us. Um, so I think when you're unsure and starting off, you want something shorter to allow you to flex if you do need to flex. But the downside here is now things go really well and you want to stay in that place because we all say location, location, location. There. So it depends where your practice is. And if you're in a good place, you want to hold on to that. So then you want a longer lease to actually stabilize that because can you imagine the landlord comes along and suddenly you do your practices just picking up and they go, it's time for you to go out. We're going to bring in a bounce or a, a virgin active or something in here and your practice needs to skedaddle. And um, that can really have an impact on your practice. So, so there's, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, my recommendation would be when you're starting a new and you're not 100% sure, start for, with a shorter lease, but be sure that you contract your first uh, offer of refusal. So that, you know, at, when that year comes to an end, you can actually say it's up to me to refuse first before you can put somebody else in and then start looking at extending that. Now, I think the other part on lease agreements and people often fall into this trap is that you look at your square meterage rate and you go, that's actually a great rate. I'm going to settle for this one, not that one, because the per square meter rand rate is lower. But the inflation year on year is 10 percent or 8 percent. Now, that, you might look at that and say, well, that's only 3 percent more than inflation. But do that over five years and look at what that compound effect looks like. You are going to burn, Buddha. So be careful about what those inflations look like as well. Do the calculations. Do those forecasts to see what it's going to look like in year five because you now you're contracting and signing into that. So be careful. Yeah. Wise words. That's often, that's, often the, that's often the heartache for most uh, practitioners is that point. is the, the, the lease increment um, rental rates per annum. Um, that increase extensively, and people yeah. often miss those little fine prints that's in the in the contract there. Um, just add on to that point, there, Dion, is that um, often people also look at space to to rent, and what I find is is that the space would be advertised at 180 rand per square meter, and that's quite true, but that's only for that square meter of space. But often where people fall into a pit is that they never factor in the operational cost that goes with that the refuge, the removal, um, your water and electricity, your rates and taxes, all of those things are excluded. And then yeah. when you actually do your calculation, the amount of space that you've taken will eventually be like 400 Rand, very quickly and very easily um, per, per, per square meter. meter. So that's something you definitely need to be very careful of and make sure you do careful planning around that and work out your finances to make sure that you can afford it. And that is not only gonna be like 180, Rand a square meter, but it will be 400 yep. Rand a square meter for the amount of space mm. that you take out. Yeah. Very good. But guys, I, I want you to pause there because both of you are ready to sign lease agreements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but surely there's a step that needs to happen before then. You need to be registered with HPCSA. What about BHF? I'm not sure who can answer that for us. What what other requirements do do you need to have in place before you can open up your own practice? What about a bank account? Yeah, listen, uh, Dion, I don't know who's going to win this arm wrestle, yeah, to, to <laughs> go for this point first. <laughs> you <know> first. <laughs> um, Lonnie, let's just quickly backtrack to that first point of yours. I mean, location. Now, now what about location? Um, we've discussed the lease now. Um, basically, your location will be de determined by your target market. Um, just don't open, please don't open up a location, a practice anywhere, any location. Location is exceptionally important mm -hmm. and it's vitally important that you line up your location with your target market. So make sure that you do a due diligence before the time to know where your target market is and that will actually allow you to make sure you are in the right location that you are going to see business coming through your doors. You know? mm -hmm. Secondly, you, you're talking about re registrations with a BHF and, and um, HPCSA and so forth. But yes, firstly, you need to have a bank account. And, um, Opening up a bank account is also quite tricky sometimes, but it's very important. And the one thing that I really want to highlight here is please do not use your personal bank account for your practice or for your business. Amen. The reason for that is, is that you will never know where you are in your business if you have your personal affairs mixed up with your business affairs. So preferably, if possibly, go and open up a business bank account. Because then with your business bank account, you can keep your personal affairs and your business affairs separate and you will know exactly where you are and where you're at within your business. And Dion, I think this is something you've, you've preached to me like a million times. So I don't know if you have a few points to add on to that uh, factor. 
Yeah, thanks, Bert. You, you took the words out of my mouth. I think it's crucial, you know, as a as a solace practitioner, um, you don't need to register a company number or anything like that. You can practice in your personal name, but very often people then stumble into saying, well, if it's my personal name, I'll use my personal account and sometimes even a savings account. Um, and uh, and that's the danger because on that same account, your poor accountant at the end of the year or end of the month is going, right, what's business expenses? I see school fees here. How, how, how are we handling that? This Woolworths purchase, is this business or is this personal? And it's all so dear my card that it's very difficult to understand. Now, yes, SAR sees you as one entity and they're going to take all of those and look at them together. But how are you going to get an idea of actually what's going on in the practice? Um, so separating those bank accounts, practice expenses in the practice account, money from medical schemes and patients coming into the practice account, paying yourself a salary from that into your personal account and then doing your personal things um, is, is really just that separation of, of those two it goes a really long way to helping solace practitioners to actually manage their, their, their finances and actually see if the practice is running at a profit or not. And I think the other element with these banks, while we're talking about bank accounts, is the, the mistake I see solace practitioners doing very often is going, right, so I paid all my expenses, it's the 27th of the month, how much is left in my account? Okay, there's 12,000 or 20,000 or whatever the number is, that's my salary, I'm gonna draw it down to zero and I'm gonna now survive on that and next month I'll build it up again, right? I see that very often. And, and, and the scary thing about that is you don't know what your income's going to be, um, you're taking what's left and the worst part is you're drawing it down to zero. Now, for pre-COVID days, fortunately, I've been saying this for many years, so hopefully the guys that have heard it have applied it in some way, which would have helped them through the COVID times. Because we always say, what is your financial policy? And your first financial policy that I think is critical to put in place is, how much do I need to leave in my bank account over which I can then play with? that money that's over that. And often people are saying it's zero and anything over that I can play with. Now that's dangerous. I would recommend anywhere between three and six months. Now with COVID behind us, I'm gonna say six months. If you're operating expenses, in other words, paying your receptionist, paying yourself the salary that you need, the minimum salary you need to cover your bond and all your commitments at home and so on, um, your rent, uh, your, your staff, your, 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 you know, all those, your, your license fees for your software and so on. Um, what does that come to per month? That's your operational costs. And if that comes to 80, 000, let's use 100,000 Rand as an easy number, then you should take 100,000 times six and say 600,000 is where my bank account needs to get up to to give me that stability. And the one Rand over 600,000 I can play with. I can invest it. I can buy this new equipment. I can start accumulating that towards my expensive equipment and so on. So that should something go wrong, now we can use the example of COVID um, and my income is, is reduced considerably, I've got six months to plan. I've got six months to scale it down, to consider telehealth platforms and, and try and drive that, to consider a different place to, to actually practice from, um, to, to whatever it might be, but I could, I've got time to flex um, or hope that we can get through the crisis and pick up again. So those who had a financial policy of six months slush fund that they keep behind, and you can invest that, you can put it in your bond, you can put it in a longer term investment to get good interest, but that's not yours to play with. It's only over that that you can then start playing. So I think that's crucial that we don't use target a zero or even worse, my overdraft to pay my salary and then hope by the end of the month I'm back into the plus. And we do see this, unfortunately, very often. Hmm. Mm. Um, BHF, is that a yes or a no? Do you need a number from BHF? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you cannot practice without a practice number. So... Once you have your location, you know your, your, your physical address, you have open up a bank account, uh, you have a business entity, you've decided on whether you're going to go solace or partnership or incorporated or association, um, and then you have a business name. Once you have all of those documents together, then you can um, head on to the Board of Health Funders or BHF to acquire a PCNS number, which mm -hmm. is a practice coding number from their system. And once you have that number, you can then be uh, registered with all the other medical aids so that you can do claiming and so forth through your practice. But yes, Ronnie, you definitely need to register with BHF to have a practice number. That is vitally important. Otherwise, you will not go far. And Bharti, mm. if you've got a, 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 a large-ish practice and it's, let's just say it's one discipline, I'll take myself, for example, a physios, let's say there's four physios, is it only the... the do you only require one BHF number and the others practice under your practice number or does each participant need a BHF practice number as well? Cool. Um, Lonnie, this is this can open up a whole can of worms here because it depends on a business entity. Okay. So 
if you have an association, each person can still practice under their own uh, practice number, but then you just form what we call a legal, a, a legal entity or legal agreement between the associates, if it's an association or a partnership, um, or an incorporation. If it's an incorporation, it will be under one practice number because then you will formulate all the disciplines together as directors. So each practitioner, whether you a physiotherapist or if you're a biochemist or a nurse or so forth, you will become a director within that company okay. and that company will have then one practice number. Can I, can I maybe just add to that? We've um, recently, uh, one of the ProfNet members actually raised something with us that they got communication from the HPCSA. So just newsflash um, on this is that um, the multidisciplinary group practices, even under incorporated companies, um, has, uh, has been stopped by the BHF to, they would register incorporated companies for a group of biokineticists practicing in that inc. The minute you try and bring in a multidisciplinary or better an interdisciplinary practice approach and other disciplines, uh, the BHF is saying create another ink or another entity and put your physios in there and your occupational therapist there and speech therapists all differently. You can bind those together with an association agreement, for example, there are other ways as well, um, but they cannot have multiple different disciplines in the same ink. Now, this is a huge, huge concern for me. Um, I think that this flies in the face of the, um, uh, the Minister of Health's strategy and vision, the NHI strategy and vision, uh, evidence-based practice as far as interdisciplinary practices and bringing those disciplines together under one and coordinating care. So, so we've put pressure on the HPCSA and we undertake to continue to do that until such time as that changes. Um, because uh, to me, that's not in the interest of, of patient care. Um, so, so we need to keep driving for that. So appeal to all, all of the, the, the members and uh, participants here on this call, put pressure on your associations and societies, go directly to the HPCSA, but put that pressure on to say, we need a declarator from the HPCSA to allow multidisciplinary group practices. They in fact did allow it before. So when I was in practice, we had uh, physio, OT and speech therapy all together in a multidisciplinary practice. And I've spoken to uh, other practices who've done the same and are operating under those 050 group practice numbers. Yeah. Um, but the HPCSA has, in fact, put out something quite recently to say, no more, you need to change those structures. So uh, I really believe we need to be standing up and taking a, a position on this, on an evidence-based and patient-based interest approach to say, we have to coordinate these, and the best way to do those is by bringing them together in one practice. Look at the state does it. State sector has got some great uh, structures on how they run those, where the teams are actually coordinated and brought together. Yeah. I know it's not private practice, but uh, most certainly something to push against, I believe. Oh. So do you have an example that I mentioned earlier on is someone who is in, in the public sector and they want to move into private sector. So they've been having this dream about owning a private practice, but if, when is a good time to start? Is it a good time to start a private practice now? I mean, there was a, a question here from, from Stephen about uh, the economy and just the state of affairs, which, which we find ourselves in now, you know, during COVID sort of post lockdown, we're all in level two now. How long do you hold on to your dream and when do you make it a reality? Yeah, Lani, um, very good question and a valid question. So when do you start setting up your practice? And the answer is pretty much now. <laughs> um, whether you are planning to open up a practice next week or whether you are planning to open up a practice in five years time, the decision to open up your practice and a planning process starts today. Now, I remember an author and speaker by the name of John Wooden once said that it's too late to prepare when your opportunity arrives or comes. And that is so, so true. Because you will never know when this opportunity is coming. Whether you're planning to open up the practice in the next year or not, you will never know when your opportunity comes. So when your opportunity comes, make sure that you are well prepared. But yes, Lani, definitely you want to start now with the process. And even if you don't start with the whole process, but you just start step by step and bits by bits, that will help you a lot. Because you don't want to be in a position where you feel that you should have opened or should have started with the planning process earlier. Because remember, as we discussed earlier, the planning process will actually determine the success of your practice. Mm -hmm. And that's so vitally important that you focus a lot on the planning process. Um, just thinking now, um, a lady by the name of Karen Lamb actually said once, a year from now, you may wish you had started today. And that is very true. So rather, start early, start today with your planning process. And that will make definitely 
uh, make the process much easier for you later on. And the more you're planning now, the less you have to do when your practice is open. The less you do now, the more you're going to have to do when your practice is open. So rather have the, the former in that aspect. Um, just in here on to Stephen's uh, comment. Yeah, yeah. listen, I, I, I think obviously, um, you know, the solution to that is that you need to go back to the drawing board. Um, one thing that uh, we didn't touch base on um, earlier is vision. You kind of need to have a vision for your practice. That is the most essential part for me in my practice that I'm focusing, focusing on is that I have a vision and everything else stems from that vision. So if you have a vision and you've written it down, the vision will give you an idea of where you are heading. It's basically seeing the future from, from um, before it comes into being. So rather focus on that vision and then build everything else on from that vision. All the steps in the planning process that we have discussed today to actually find the better solutions and the better business types and ideas that you can apply to your business to grow your practice and grow your business. Um, I do believe there's large scope for growth in this current economic state because I've seen many practices during these times, um, especially during lockdown, that has actually seen record numbers um, year on year and month on month. So that is evidence that there's definitely scope for, for growth and there is, uh, mm -hmm. there is potential economic growth in that, in that factor. So yes, Lonnie, um, I think one of the biggest barriers to starting your practice is procrastination. So rather focus on avoiding pr procrastination, which is a pitfall for most of us as practitioners and start with the planning process today as of after this webinar. The time is now. <laughs> the time is now, definitely. Lonnie, yeah, I think we've used the quote before in one of our previous webinars too, but just to tie in with Barry's quotes there, uh, Winston Churchill said that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and, and yes, we've been in a, big crisis. I think we're coming out of that crisis. And those that are still able to set up and grow or establish practices, uh, there's very strong upside from here going forwards. Mm -hmm. When you start a practice and everything's sweet and hunky-dory at the top, you can imagine last year, January, February, people going, now is the time, things are looking good, um, everything's hunky-dory, and then suddenly you've got COVID that comes along. That's tough to hold on at that point. Yeah, so yeah. I think, um, are we through the crisis? Absolutely no. Um, but I think this is a, an opportunity, as you rightly say, to do the planning, get the structures in place and go in with your eyes wide open, do your research. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that there's huge opportunities and uh, uh, those with appetite for risk and entrepreneurial type of approaches are, are, are not running away right now, they're running at it. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, Dion, there's a question that came up from Devon and it's about insuring your practice. A, do you need to insure your practice and what sort of a financial impact is that going to have on your, on your practice? Sure. Yeah, I think there's, there's various insurances that one has to consider. Obviously, the first and foremost is your medical malpractice insurance, your professional indemnity. Now, now that's a requirement for whether you've got your own practice or you're working for somebody or you're in the state. It doesn't matter. The minute you're touching a patient, if something goes wrong in that and they report you and there's a claim against you for negligence, um, then you want to be sure that you've got insurance in place unless you've got massive coffers of millions of rons. Um, that you're happy to pay out should that happen. But we'd really encourage, it's not uh, regulated, I think in some disciplines it is, um, but it's not regulated, but we'd highly recommend that you have medical malpractice insurance in place. So that's the first one. And the others are obviously when you're opening up your practice is insurance, short-term insurance for things like your equipment, you're spending money on equipment, if they steal your laptop, um, what is that going to cost and, and how do you insure that? Um, and then there's obviously the other insurance of, of, of income protection. So, uh, you know, whether you're earning a salary or running a practice, you can insure yourself. I think many of us are very familiar with the PPS uh, type of approach um, that should you uh, be sick or disabled, um, you've got uh, uh, your salaries covered and, and, and you've got that security. So that's just three examples of insurance that one should consider. Mm -hmm. There's obviously many more, even medical aid insurance is another, taking out insurance for your staff. Um, don't forget public, uh, public liability insurance. Mm -hmm. So that's the slips and trips type of insurance. So somebody comes into your waiting area, sits on the chair and the chair breaks. Okay. That wasn't your medical negligence. Uh, the, 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 we all heard the stories, your motorized gate closes on the patient's uh, car as they're going out. Um, that's a, a public liability insurance. It's a very small premium, but make sure you are covered in that. And I think many of the products, especially in allied healthcare space for um, practitioners, is uh, it's included in your medical malpractice insurance. So just check all of those. So, uh, Devon, I hope that answers most of your questions, but you're also asking your annual registrations. Yes. So, yeah. 
So, so there your annual registrations for your health for your regulator, whether it's HPCSA or allied HPCSA or others, the South African Nursing Council, and that's a requirement again, whether you're in private practice or owning your own practice or not. Um, and uh, yeah, other annual registrations. Obviously, there's tax registrations, there's um, uh, BHF registrations and renewals. So make sure that those are all in place. So I hope I've answered some of your questions, but it's quite a broad a broad array that one has to obviously make sure is in place. Yeah. I'm just keeping an eye on the time there. Um, Barty, one word that you've mentioned quite a few times is the word pitfalls. Now, you've mentioned a few, but are there some others that you would just like to highlight to our audience that people need to, to sort of watch out for? Sure, Lani. Unfortunately, there are many. Um, so, yes, I mean, pitfalls, I um, also mentioned earlier about blind spots. Um, yeah. Those are very, very key areas that you definitely will have to look at. Uh, pitfalls are often the things that you set yourself up for. Um, it's things that you kind of know. It's also things that you can identify yourself. Self, and it's often things that you find yourself in. Uh, whereas blind spots, on the other hand, are the things that you don't see yourself. So blind spots are more likely to be something that someone else will identify. And um, yes, I mean, we've, we've mentioned quite a few in this talk, but just coming to think of a few that, that's standing out for us, and that is probably opening up your practice too soon, too quick. Uh, without a planning process. Uh, that's something we've kind of mentioned. Um, the other fa factors that set you up for pitfalls are obviously being unethical. So a lot of practitioners tend to take shortcuts and that obviously imposes onto the unethical status. Um, so you've got to be very careful for taking shortcuts and trying to go cheap into your practice or too cheap mm -hmm. and trying to avoid payments uh, like Dion said, especially from your registrations, trying to avoid your registrations and avoiding um, um, insurance, uh, uh, indemnities and those type of things, that's very, very important. Um, otherwise, um, also failure to, to sacrifice is another factor. That's a huge pitfall. People don't often understand that it requires a lot of effort mm. to set up your practice and it also requires a lot of effort to manage your practice. So, so you definitely want to make sure that you have an, a lot of time, talent and, and, and treasure or, or, or money that you're going to sacrifice in, in building this practice. Um, so yes, Lonnie, I think those are the key components, but what stands out there for me that can actually assist the viewers in, in preventing these pitfalls or blind spots is actually two simple questions. The first question is you've got to ask yourself, um, what is there possible that you could set yourself up as a pitfall? And then you obviously have to analyze your business from A to Z and try and identify any of these pitfalls. The second question is, is to rather ask someone else to evaluate and analyze your, your business or your practice. And I've done this before with, with someone who analyzed my practice and there were so many aspects or so many blind spots that we've referred to that I've never seen, but this person managed to see it just because they had a different eye for it. So yes, definitely, if you want to prevent these pitfalls and blind spots, ask yourself the question and ask someone else to evaluate your, your progress yeah. and your practice setup within your sure. practice, yes. Perfect. That Thanks, Barty. Dion, yeah, definitely. No, definitely. Thank you. Barty, I'm going to come back to you in two minutes. And Barty was kind enough, guys, um, to, to prepare two slides for us. And maybe, Barty, you're just willing to quickly summarize the discussion today and use one or both of them. And we will be able to share the slides with all the attendees. We'll put it on our website. So, Barty, you can perhaps prepare for that in the meantime. But Dion, are you prepared to, to answer Tasneem's um, last question there, where she's trying to play devil advocate? And I know everyone can read the chat, so I don't mind saying it. Like, when is a good time in your private practice journey that you should invest, and again, it's money, into a good practice management application system, for example, EasyMed, versus keeping it paper-based or, or you know, using a billing administrator per, per claim? Is there a good time? So, so I'm, I'm going to zoom back on that and, and maybe just try and take a neutral position. I think everybody knows our position on EasyMed and ProfNet. Um, but the advice that I'd give to you is, um, you know, if, if you need legal advice, the last person you're going to go to is to a physiotherapist to give you legal advice. And if you do listen to the advice at your peril. So why do we do the opposite? As physios, we might look at it and go, I don't need a lawyer in my practice. I'm going to do that. I'm sure I can Google some stuff. I'll figure this out as I'm going along. I mean, that's, that's, that's scary. Um, we do that with accounting, we do that with legal legal processes, and we do that with our practice management systems. 
Um, and all of these come with lessons. And trust me, if you're wanting to learn lessons in the streets of life, that's the best way to go. But I do think you can learn lessons from other people's mistakes. And I, I, we've made it ourselves. I'm really saying this not, not from a, posi a position of higher ground. When we started our practice, we thought there's absolutely no need. This is quite funny. But there's no need to employ a credit controller to follow up on our accounts with our medical aids. And we were five partners in the practice. And we said, oh, it's quite easy. We divide all the medical aids up into, into fits. And each person takes a fifth. And I had A to, a to D, which included Discovery Health. So, man, I ended up with the bulk of it. And what we thought was we'll finish our patients at four. And then from four to six, we'll follow up with medical aids. I tell you, we ran out of talent so quickly. Um, and we paid the price for years after that because we had to write off monies because we thought we could do that. So I think the take home message here is get the right people to do the right job, get the right systems that do the right job. Van goed koop is dier koop. You really are going to pay the price. So I really would recommend somebody ask the question on a good ICD-10 browser as well. Guys, you can, you can do it. You can Google it. Trust me, be careful of Googling it because you're probably going to find the USA ICD-10 codes, which aren't appropriate in South Africa. Yeah. So watch out for that. Get the right system. Again, you can use a flat file from the um, Department of Health, the MIT tables. It is there. So you can go and look at it and then you get and get good at control F in Excel and try and find those codes. But there's no intelligence behind that. It's just giving you a flat number. Find yourself a good system that can, re can return those results yeah. you're looking for because you really are setting yourself up for success that way. Um, so yeah, so, I, that would be a recommendation. Cool. Bertie, yeah. I'll give you two minutes to summarize, but feel free to share your screen, please. You've, you've got the ability to do that. So, uh, I don't know if you guys can see my, can you see my screen there, Lani? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so so basically, maybe Bertie, we can only, we can see it separated off. Do, do a side show view. I think it actually has. Uh, so what you need to do is put it in slideshow view before you actually hit the share button on on, on Zoom. It, it is a bit tricky. What I'm going to do is just hang on a second. Just going to duplicate this. Is that better there? Uh, not sure. I think yet. it's still coming. Do you see it there? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Okay, so let me just quickly try this. Can you see it now? Nothing on my side. Goodness, I can see it from my side. Sorry, guys. Let me just have a look here. Just unshare and share and again. And now, can can you share? Can you see it there? Okay, so let's just try again. Share. Can you see there it now? Okay. There we go. There we go. Yes, great stuff, guys. So obviously. Between uh, Dion and my comments, we've just set up 10 key steps to successfully set up your practice from thought to opening up your practice. So just quickly, what we're going to do is we are going to go into point number one. Point number one is watch this webinar again and pick up some thoughts and tips that we've mentioned that you might have missed during, the, during this period. And that will definitely help you to actually uh, just guiding you through the process. Step number two is determine your purpose and vision for setting up a practice. Number three was prepare a business plan. Number four, identify your target market. And yes, can I just add in there, look out, I think for next week's uh, webinar, if I'm correct, okay, about marketing ethically and so forth. But Lani, you will discuss that more in detail now. Um, number fifth, step number five is select a location or venue. Number six is decide on a business type and then a practice name. Step number seven, open up a bank account. Step number eight, register with your regulatory bodies. That is like DHF, SARS, SIPSI, and all of those. And step number nine is acquire management and operational systems. That's such as your bookkeeping systems, your practice management systems, maybe your telephone, your stationery, and all of those things. And then point number 10, the most important, don't forget to have fun. Yes, and that is my slide there. Done. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bertie. And you did that in record time. Perhaps you can just stop <laughs> sharing. <laughs> we will put that up on our website for you so that you can refer back to that if you didn't manage to get a screen grab of that. Dion Bertie, I am 100% convinced that our attendees got a lot of amazing tips and insights from you this afternoon with regards to starting a private practice or just doing a sense check of your own private practice to make sure that you've got everything in place. But now what? 
you've got your purpose, you've got your goals, you've got your business plan, the strategy, you've even got the, the best machine. But how do you grow your practice? How do you make sure that it is sustainable? And how do you ethically market your practice? And I really want to invite all the attendees to come and join us next week, where we will be unpacking just this topic. And we're going to call in a podiatrist. She's the director of our own private practice, Megan Maddox, to come and join us and just share her own experiences in the business. Um, you can register now. You can just log on to our website, EasyMedDoc Solutions, navigate to the webinar tab. And we really hope to see you all with us next week. Dion, Bertie had a last thought. Over to you for one more sentence, and then we need to log off. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Um, thank you. So sorry, I think we, we, we have, you wanted me to talk, Lonnie? Yes, please. Um, yeah, I think there's just so much to still talk about. And um, uh, yeah, I think we could be busy for a long time. Um, I think maybe we can invite Bertie back again to, I think, take the next step up into, into sort of uh, putting our practice on steroids. Um, but yeah, I think the, the next few steps of, of growing your practice and marketing and the final one about how do you prepare your practice for sale, which will be in two weeks time, is really of great value. And again, just like Bertie says, uh, a good time to start thinking about how you're going to do it and planning to open your practice is now. Um, at the same time, the best time to start planning for the sale of your practice is now. Um, and that sounds quite strange, but we're going to be unpacking that in two weeks time. How do you prepare your practice for sale? But thank you, Bertie, for joining us. It's really been amazing. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your inputs and your, your questions and comments. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lonia. Thank you, Dion. Really appreciate it. I really trust and believe that today's core values and steps that we discussed will definitely help you in growing your practice and also successfully start, start with the setup of practice. And um, yeah, just remember what you believe and apply is what you will achieve. So I really wish every listener the greatest success for their practice, whether you're starting out or whether you are continuing to grow into other practices, but all the best from our side. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Awesome. Bertie, Thank you, Bertie. I know we're running over time, but I do want to give Bertie one opportunity to quickly tell us what Boss is planning for next year for all the biokineticists on the line. Uh, just a brief, quick overview, Bertie. You're taking over as president at the end of the year. So congratulations on that. You've got some plans and ideas for, for biokinetics in South Africa and uh, your roadshow. Do you want to maybe just, uh, just let everyone know about that before we sign out? Yeah, Dion, obviously we are deeply in the planning process now. Uh, we are busy creating huge inspirational visions and, and purposes and goals for, our, for the profession going forward in the next few years. Um, obviously, we are also working on the roadshows that will start in March, right up until September. And then we will finish off the roadshows at the International Festival for Sports and Exercise Medicine Conference. Now, that is actually the SASMA conference. Um, the Life Through Movement or the BASA conference decided to, to do a joint conference with SASMA and with, uh, with uh, the other associations. So we are looking forward to that. Um, definitely look out for that. If you do want to have more information about today's discussions and topic, I do believe that that's going to be the perfect platform for you to gain more valuable information to grow your practice successfully. More. Thank you, Dion. We look forward to that. I'm sure it's all on biokineticsa.org. No, is that right? Yeah, it's on biokineticsa.org.za. So all the information that you would like to know about the roadshows and also the conferences that will take place next year, you will find there on the events calendar. Thank you, Dion. Fantastic. Thanks, Bertie. Fantastic afternoon. Thank you, guys. Bertie, thanks again for joining us. Dion, for sharing your valuable time with us as well. Attendees, thank you all for your fantastic questions. You kept these two gentlemen on their toes this afternoon. And the last thought from my side, remember, when you feel like stopping, think why you started. Have a lovely mm -hmm. afternoon, and we'll see you all next week, folks. Take care. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.